Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's going to be a nibble-sized video, not the usual mail call. Well, actually, correction, this is actually a mail call item. I'm holding it in my hand here. This is something I got quite a ways ago, I think back in July. I've been holding on to it. I haven't shown it on any mail calls up to this point because I wanted to make a dedicated video about this. And it's one of the things that ends up happening uh, that delays mail call items for quite a while. I have a few other things that I've also set aside from regular mail call videos. They didn't get shown there and I intended to turn them into standalone videos, which can end up delaying things really badly. I feel bad because I want to show this stuff. People sent this in and I, I don't want to hold on to it for six months before I show it. So on today's video, I'm going to try to rectify the situation and finally show this. So let's get right to it. So what you see on the bench here are two Macintosh computers. This is my Macintosh 2CI, and this is a Mac Classic 2. Even though it's in a classic case, it's what I call the Stealth Classic 2. What do these machines have in common, and why am I talking about them here? Well, both of these machines use 30-pin memory. And unlike a lot of older Macintoshes that also use 30-pin memory, and I'm sorry, when I say 30-pin memory, I'm talking about SIMs, single inline memory modules. What differentiates these machines and also other Macintoshes around this time, as well as PCs and probably other machines like Suns and other workstations, is that they can use 30-pin memory larger than one megabyte. This computer here, the Mac 2 CI, can use up to 16 megabyte 30-pin SIMs, and it has eight slots in it, giving a total memory capacity of 128 megabytes. Pretty amazing for a computer from the late 80s. The Mac SE 30 also has eight slots, can also go up to 128 megabytes. The Classic 2, on the other hand, has merely two megabytes of memory built in, but it has two 30-pin memory slots, and Apple designed the computer to accept up to four megabyte memory SIMs. So you could have a total of 10 megabytes in the Mac Classic 2. Now, of all the 30-pin memory that's been sent in for mail call donations, it's entirely been 256K SIMs and one megabyte SIMs, meaning that in this machine, I could get a total of eight megabytes, and in this one, I could get a total of four megabytes. The four and 16 megabyte SIM varieties of the 30 pin memory are just rare and hard to find because it was very soon after those larger capacities started coming out that 72 pin memory really took off. And as you've seen in mail calls, if you watch those, I have gotten a ton of 72 pin memory. Unfortunately, that's no good. It doesn't help these machines. These need these higher capacity four megabyte SIMs. Now checking out eBay, there are sellers currently selling 30 pin memory of the higher capacity variety. In fact, I have 64 megabytes in my Mac 2 CI because I ended up buying four of the 16 megabyte SIMs from one of these sellers. It's very likely that due to the scarcity of these modules, it's just gonna become expensive to buy them for these computers. So we really need a better solution. And here in this box and in this tube is one such solution to this RAM problem. It turns out there's a thread on Vogons talking about this exact problem and a group of individuals got together and designed an open source PCB of SIM replacements of the four megabyte variety. Alex actually had drop shipped all the various components to make this up from suppliers, which is why I didn't show me opening this on mail calls. So we have a tube of the actual SMD RAM chips themselves. We have a whole selection of PCBs here sent directly from JLPCB, drop shipped to me, and as well, the bypass capacitors that are required for these memory modules. And with a little hot air and hand soldering, that should allow me to build up 10 of these four megabyte SIMs. Now, even though a bunch of time has passed, I'm not sure that the PCB design is up on GitHub quite yet, because I think Alex wanted to make sure that these definitely work before publishing this so people don't go and make a bunch of memory that is faulty. So hopefully my testing here results in some positive results. Taking a closer look at the PCBs, you can see it's version 2.0, four megabyte SIM, the open source hardware logo there over on the right. There are space for three chips, which is enough for uh, two chips for the four megabytes and then a parity RAM chip. And on the back, it just simply says, let's make some memories. I absolutely love it. That's the name of this project. 
in this tube are RAM chips, and there are 20 of them, so that means there's enough for me to populate two per memory module, which means I won't be, of course, using parity. Hopefully the camera is resolving the text on the chip here, but there is the Toshiba part number. I'll put it in the description in case anyone wants to buy some of these yourself, but these came directly from an electronic supplier, so that I presume to think that these are still available. So for doing the actual soldering onto these uh, little boards here, I am an extreme noob, which means that there's probably a good chance that I, A, I'm gonna ruin the soldering and it's, these aren't gonna work because of my crappy soldering, and B, my technique is so bad that if I get it to work, please don't follow my crap technique for actually doing this yourself. Watch some other videos on the internet with people who are actual experts at doing this stuff and aren't gonna be blundering around with the hot air and the soldering iron like I will. I will be using some flux, which is in this pen here. I'll be putting that over the contacts. And then I have here some no clean solder paste from MG Chemicals. If you're buying solder paste or you're buying regular solder, please use good reputable brands. I use Kester solder here on my little spool because uh, the cheap stuff I found is just not that good. And I've had much better luck with this. So I just stick to this. I think I got this from Amazon or might've been DigiKey, I can't remember. But either way, it wasn't too expensive and it looks like it comes, I haven't even opened this yet. It looks like it's a syringe looking thing. Yeah, it looks like I can pop this cap off. You put this plunger in, there's a little needle here for applying it. I got 6337 lead tin mix, which after doing some reading, the, this is pretty much the best stuff for hobbyist use. And in this little anti-static bag, we should have bypass caps and we do, these are probably just 100 nanofarad or something like that. And we only need two per memory module. They just go right there and right there. For me personally, for any kind of work like this, because I'm getting old and my eyes aren't so great, I use one of these head mounted magnifying thingies. <laughs> this is a godsend for me. I mean, also if you have some good glasses, you could use those as well. But I really recommend something like this if you're doing any surface mount soldering. Sorry for the shaky camera, but this is my hot air station that I'm gonna be using to attach the chips. I'm gonna probably run it at 350 degrees Celsius, which is typically what I keep this at. Before I get started, I'm gonna be installing two chips on this board and it's gonna go into this position, IC1, and this position, IC2. And the reason why I know that those are the two I'm installing is because look at the number of pads here and here. There are more than on this memory chip. And that's because each of these chips, I'm pretty sure are four megabytes times four bits. So two of these makes eight bits. And then the parity chip, I think, is a one megabyte times four chip. So it adds an extra four bits. I'm probably wrong about the parity chip, but I know that the chips that Alex sent me have the right number of pins to fit the number of pads on these two positions. So those are the two chips I'm gonna be installing. So because I'm gonna be using hot air and I'm gonna be putting it right close to the desk, this desk's already in terrible shape. So I'm going to put down my little, uh, what is this, silicone mat here that should be heat resistant to help not melt the desk. All right, first to start off with this solder paste here, let's squish some out. Oh, this is pretty hard. Hmm, well, I might have screwed up already. It says store refrigerated user room temperature. I didn't realize I need to refrigerate this. <laughs> I've had it for a couple months now. <laughs> Although it came from Amazon or wherever, and I doubt they were refrigerating it. So why is it so hard to get out of here? Is it even, is it even flowing? No, I guess it's coming out, okay. All right, I just have to squeeze a little bit harder but it's definitely coming out. There it is. Okay, great. All right, well, let's start with flux on the pads here. So I have to admit, I've never used solder paste, so I don't know how much to apply. Seems like that's gonna be too much. Well, I don't have a lot of confidence. I, I'm sure I put way too much on there. It wasn't really sticking. I thought it was gonna be a lot more liquid. It's really thick, pasty, kind of gloopy. I thought it was gonna be very liquid and just sort of, I could put a very fine line across all the pads and just squish the chip on there and then hit it with hot air and it would all melt. And it's this horrible paste. So this, this might be a giant failure. I'm just gonna apply some flux onto the uh, pins. And this is because the paste doesn't have any flux in it. It's just the solder only. So I'm going to need to have flux added to it just so it sticks to things. Okay, and then I'm gonna use my tweezers to place the chip. There's a little dot right here that matches up with the dot on the IC. Of course, you can't see it because there's so much of that paste glooped on there. 
Um, yeah, this is just... Oh, I forgot to put flux. Darn it. And we have bypass caps, which are tiny. And if you don't watch out, they could go flying and you end up <laughs> losing them. Of course, these cost nothing each. They're dirt cheap. Put a little flux on there. Just drop these into position there and there. I mean, hopefully the solder is going to melt and it will help position those chips. And here we go. Let's give this a try. I have very low confidence that this is actually going to work. Well, the solder is melting. That's great. Is it actually... No, the chip is not positioned correctly. It's off by one pin. Oh, crap. All right, what happened is it did get soldered and it's offset one pin because I couldn't really see that it wasn't in the right position because there was so much of that paste there. So it's actually on there. Um, most of the solder joints look good. There's a bridge there, but that's because it's missing. It's not on the right thing. Oops, this pin, this chip just fell off. But everything actually works. So let's try again with this one here. I did position it to make sure it's in the right spot. Wow, it's so cool. It just sort of moves into the right position. So it might be okay, the chip on the left. There are some bridged pins there. But I don't know, maybe this worked. Definitely the other one needs to be fixed. I have to remove the chip and move it over one set of pins. Well, clearly one problem is there was too much solder underneath it, the paste that is. I really have to only get it on the pins. And uh, that, so there's two big blobs here. I gotta clean those up. So I'm gonna use some MG Chemicals Super Wick solder braid and we're just gonna get this, get these blobs off of here. And I'm going to be using hot air to reapply this chip, so I'm just going to move it into position. I'm going to take the other one off because I see there's some blobs underneath it because I put too much paste. Oh, it's actually pretty good under here. So I'm just going to fix these pads with the soldering iron, get everything nice and flat. Good coverage. Well, okay, I think I've ruined this first sim. Um, it's pretty warped, the PCB. These are pretty thin, so they're flexible. But it's all warped now. Th those two pins are bridged. I think I've just, I put too much heat on there. I'm gonna do the next one without using this paste because I, I don't know, maybe I bought the wrong stuff, whatever. I'm just gonna do it by hand and I think it's gonna go a lot better than, than this terrible one here. Like I had mentioned, I didn't really want this to turn into a, a soldering tutorial because that's exactly what it's not because I am just no expert at this type of work. I'm, I'm really a novice when it comes to surface mount soldering. So it's best not to pay attention to anything I'm doing. And I'm sure that people will have plenty of critique. Feel free to put that in the comment section. But right now I just have flux on the pads and I am gonna be applying the solder directly to it. I will put flux on the bottom of the chip and then I will just use the hot air to kind of melt everything and stick the chip on. All right, so I have two that are done. One is done with paste, which I think is this warped one, this one here, and this one was done by hand. They're both messy, they're both super ugly. I'm just going to quickly test all the pins for shorts. I cleared that one short on this pin, I think. Oh, 
Okay, the warped one doesn't have any shorted pins. That's a good sign. Uh, this one, this is the one I did by hand. This this chip is not on the pads very well. I just don't have it centered on the pins. In fact, now that I'm looking at it sideways, like I see this pin's not even connected. In fact, several of these aren't connected. So, yep, I did a horrible job as usual. All right, I think these are both done. I'm gonna go clean them off in the sink and get the flux off of here. <sighs> okay, I have the soldering iron out because I was just looking at the joints on some of these pins and it's a mess. There are a bunch that don't look like they're connected. So I'm gonna have to go over these one by one with this, try to heat it up and flow some solder on there, get that stuff sticking. Doing surface mount work like this is definitely something that is a learned technique. And as you get better at it, it becomes much easier. For me right now, this is very difficult. and. I'm going to just turn the camera off right now and, and work on these because the camera in the way actually makes it um, an extra order of magnitude for me harder because I don't even know what I'm doing in the first place and the camera just makes it more difficult. So let's jump cut. Okay, I have four done and I think the soldering is okay. Basically, if you're going to do any of these, you have to have some type of a magnification eye loop to inspect the, the solder you've done. There were lots of pins that weren't connected, not lots, but there was a few here and there. So I had to go correct that. There were bridged ones, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. I ended up putting these in my ultrasonic cleaner to clean them off, but you can put them under soap and water and just use a scrub brush or IPA as well, dry them off. Ultrasonic cleaner did a pretty good job. I had to switch my soldering iron to the really fine tip. Can you see it there? Hopefully it is visible. It's bent and curved and very, very fine. And that was really the only way I could get in there and clear the bridges because for whatever reason, the solder bridges were underneath the chip, like it's kind of behind. So this tip is fine enough with this pin pitch. I could actually get in between those legs and clean them out and kind of get that bridge out of there. This one here is the original bent one. So it is slightly bent. Uh, the other three here are not bent at all. All four of these were done with the solder paste. The one that I started doing with the hand soldering, it, it got ruined. Some of the traces and uh, pads came off just because there were so many bridge <laughs> connections and I was trying to clean it all up. And as I did, the traces and the pads started coming off. So yep, that one just got tossed. Luckily, I still have five more of these PCBs. So if these do work, I'll build up the rest. But I figured because while I'm getting better at doing these, uh, the fourth one was a little bit easier than the, the earlier ones. I would rather not build the rest of them up if there's something wrong with the PCBs. Let's bust out a computer and test these out. So these are the two SIM sockets on the Mac Classic. This is one megabyte, two megabytes built in. And let's install a couple of these. So this has metal clips which is why I like testing RAM and stuff in this thing and not say on the Mac SE30, which those plastic clips, they break very easily. So I'll just pop in these two. So with each of these four megs, that's eight. And then another two on the motherboard is 10 total. That is the maximum that this computer supports. You can't put larger SIMs in here. You can't put the 16 meg ones in here and for instance, have 32, what, 34 megabytes. And that's because the chipset on here just doesn't support more memory than that. It controls the memory map, even though the processor is 32-bit, supports, I don't even know what a 32-bit Motorola processor can go up to, something like a gigabyte or whatever, lots of RAM. This thing just, it will not do it. So keep that in mind if you have a Classic 2. I have a small nugget of advice if you're working on any of these Classic Macintoshes, because you're pulling cables off like the SCSI cable and the floppy drive cable, before you do any of that, just pull the CRT neck board off. It is a good idea to do that. It just will help you never accidentally snap this because if you push up on this, you could snap the back of the CRT off, which would render it dead. And you thought you can just go to the store and buy another one. Take it from me, I have done this personally. I was a kid when I did it, but I learned my lesson and you just pull this off. It only takes a split second. That's my word of advice. All right, ready for testing. Here we go. Okay. Good sign, uh, that was the good bong. And we might get the sad Mac if it's unhappy with this butchered memory that I installed, but let's see what happens. All right, good sign, we got the mouse pointer and it's actually booting. I 
And moment of truth, how much RAM is in this computer? Here we go. Oh yeah, two, 10 megabytes. It is working, awesome. I'm just gonna quickly pull the motherboard out and put this RAM in to test out these other two modules. This module that I just popped out was the bent one and it seemed to have no problem inside the computer. So that's good. The chime was a good sign. And what do we get for the second set? 10 megabytes. Thumbs up. Incidentally, if you have a Mac Classic 2 and maybe some of the other Macs that are based on this same motherboard, like the Mac LC, I think, I found that if you upgrade it to 10 megs, the full 10 megs, it seems to run faster. Originally, when you compare this machine to the Mac SE 30, it seems to have a performance penalty mostly due to the 16-bit memory and also I think the fact that it doesn't have dedicated video RAM. I'm not sure from a technical perspective why the machine is faster with more memory, but the only thing I'm thinking is that the video memory in this thing I think is shared with the main RAM and that probably slows things down. And maybe what happens is when you have 10 megs is it puts the video memory in the motherboard two megabytes but then the main part of the computer OS and everything is running out of your extra eight megs that you added. And it kind of reserves that little bit of free memory on the motherboard till the very end. There is history for this kind of speed up. The Mac 2CI's video memory is also on the main memory or part of the main memory. And it's best on that thing to put the small capacity memory in the first four SIM slots and the large capacity in the second for the exact same reason. That motherboard puts the video buffers in those first SIMs, and that second set of SIMs is untouched. If I recall, on my own personal 2CI, I have 64 megs in the second set of RAM slots, there's four, and the first four have one meg SIMs for four megabytes total, which means that the video memory buffer is taking up like a good chunk of that first section there, and then everything else runs in that faster second set. So that might be what's going on with the Mac Classic 2. If you know anything about that, or you have empirical evidence of it being faster and more than my seat of the pants feeling, please let me know in the comment section below. So I'm really stoked I was able to make four memory modules successfully. That's pretty cool. One got sacrificed due to my ineptitude and I do have five more to make. Although nine's sort of a weird count. Uh, nothing uses one at a time. Everything is either two at a time or four at a time. So I'd have one extra module, but I'll make them up anyways, just so it's a complete set. I'll put in the description below all the links that I know of for this project, including that Vogons thread, which is the definite source of all the information you're going to need on this. I don't know if PCB files, or Gerber files are available yet. If I do find those, I'll of course put those in the description as well. So that's going to be it. I hope you enjoyed this little nibble size video. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs down button. Put your comments, your suggestions in the comment section below. And of course, subscribe to my channel if you don't mind and hit that little bell icon to be notified on your phone when I upload new videos. That's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.